basically, um, I need to, as you probably already saw, I need to admit that I'm feeling a little bit like a substitute teacher. Because really, I'm not the person who should be talking to you today. Um, because Donna Lee is the person who ran the session. What we managed to do, and, and kudos to the organising team at Agile North Hans for, for trusting me and running with me on this one. It was a, we made a request to do a slightly unorthodox uh, presentation, I suppose, a slightly unorthodox session. And Donna is a human system dynamics coach uh, in Tokyo, and she ran the live session that you're going to see a very short recording of later on and she should be here talking to you because she is the expert in this but it's sort of crazy o'clock in Tokyo at the moment and it would be completely unfair for her to be here so I'm, I'm kind of here on her behalf as a substitute teacher uh, and so the first thing I really need to do is to thank her for for running the session and for, for prepping me on this but also uh, to thank the volunteers so because what we did was we did an actual practical exercise uh, on, on someone's real wicked issue. We wanted to, to make that as real as possible uh, for everybody. And the best way to do that was to try and create some kind of safe environment. So we, we had a recording before, so we're recording in advance that you're gonna see a, a, a video of and that was held offline. Um, so thank you to all of the people who participated in that, not just Tom who put himself forward with, with his wicked issue. Um, so thank you to all of you. I'm just here to, to help run you through it really. So what is human systems dynamics? That's the first question. So HSD is basically a field of research and it's, um, it's, a, it's a practice. It could well be uh, very similar to what Imran was talking earlier on, a sort of coaching approach. It's certainly based on the same kind of principles as coaching. Um, it's fundamental assertion really is that human, any, any system that has human involvement automatically becomes a complex adaptive system. And complex adaptive systems is a field that you can you can read up on, you can research. It's a well well um, well understood and well researched area. And because, well, basically, in, in any complex adaptive system, in where anything with humans involved is, is one of those, you've got at least semi-autonomous agents. Now it's up to you whether you decide whether you are autonomous or whether you are semi-autonomous as a human being, whether your colleagues are or not. But they're free to interact with one another and and will do so in unpredictable ways. And because of that, the results of those actions and interactions with one another, those unpredictable interactions, they're going to generate what, what are called system-wide patterns. Basically, when people are involved, things get messy. All right, if I'm going to summarise it, things become unpredictable. And when you're in this kind of unpredictable environment, while it is very, very tempting to predict, because we tend to try and do that, we try and tend to reduce things down to to cause and effect and linear patterns to really be effective in those kinds of environments human systems dynamics would suggest that instead of that we need to focus our efforts on seeing what's happening try and understand the implications of the patterns that we're seeing generate options and then try and take some action to influence those patterns as they emerge so it's summarized there on this slide, we thrive because we see patterns clearly. We seek to understand and act with courage. And it does require courage to act in uncertainty, to act with unpredictability. And you'll, have heard, you'll have heard the VUCA term that we're operating in and volatile and certain complex and uh, ambiguous times. And that does cause all sorts of anxiety. It creates wicked issues first and foremost. Human systems dynamics as a field has a general operating principle of trying to create simple rules. So because we can't standardize um, actions in advance, we have to react. Human systems dynamics believes that either consciously or unconsciously, we will create simple rules, some heuristics, some, some rules of thumb, if you like, some really understood either consciously or unconsciously ways of working with one another so that we can accommodate and, and, and react in a consistent manner. So each complex adaptive system, each, um, each system will create their own simple rules, either consciously or unconsciously. These six 
on the screen here just happen to be the six uh, simple rules of the Human Systems Institute. But they're a good, they're a good example of some, some, some simple rules that will help everybody in that system act somewhat consistently while autonomously and without trying to predict the unpredictable. So bear with me on this one. So standing in inquiry, this is what we're going to spend most of the session talking about, because this is the session, this is the, the, the exercise that Donna walked our volunteers through. Um, but because of complexity and unpredictability, and unpredictability, the Human Systems Institute believe that we need to be curious. So be curious, seek to understand um, and try and find out. Uh, and come, we'll come back to that in a little bit more detail because that's going to be the main topic. Finding the energy in difference, what does that mean? Well, basically, when you're in a, in a, in a complex system, the energy is generally stored in where there are differences. These could be differences in status, in power, uh, in, in expertise, in culture, any, anything where the, the people involved in the system have significant levels of difference, we have tension and tension gives us energy. We can use that energy to influence the system. And that's all we can hope to do is influence the system because it's forever changing, it's forever evolving. Um, <clears throat> we zoom in and zoom out, what does that mean? It means that the patterns that we see are fractal. So we will see this replicating across systems at different levels, at different layers. All of our complex systems are, are made up of layers and layers and entangled relationships that we can't even begin to try and unpick and see where, where they start and where they finish. So instead we focus on patterns and we can, we can see something at a high level and we can zoom in and we can see the, the granularity of those patterns in, in real time and, and how it's really affecting things that are going on at the local level, at the personal level. But we can also zoom out from a really specific situation and see the more systemic pattern, more systemic um, significance, if you like. We connect through stories and impact, uh, just generally using the power of narrative to explain in new ways. When something's very, very complex, and a really useful tool is to analogize, to use metaphors, to use stories, to tell real examples of what we're trying to mean because the actual details are too complex for us to, 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 to get across sometimes. Um, we try and look for what's true, and I'm going to say a lot more about what, what, what we mean by that later on because that's a really important statement. But because really it's, it's quite difficult to find what's true, what's really true when things are really complex, it's actually the search for what's true that's more important than hoping to find what's true. And I know that sounds a little bit um, cryptic, but when we come on to define what a wicked problem is, that will make a lot more sense. And then finally, we celebrate life because no matter how complex how challenging and how difficult and some of these wicked problems that are out there, they are really systemic and, and very difficult and affect us very deeply and personally and globally. Um, no matter how difficult that gets, we, we, we can never really be ceased to, we never really cease to be amazed by how creative and how influential we can be as humans, as groups um, and, and as societies. And we should celebrate that. And if you want to find out more, there's, there's, there's a link there. So those are those, those are six simple rules. Those aren't the six simple rules. They are six simple rules of the Human Systems Institute. In your own complex adaptive system, you will have your own simple rules, whether or not you know them. The other thing that I want to bring up is this concept of adaptive action. Now, this was something that, that I was really pleased um, to, to learn, that this was part of human systems dynamics, because I've been using this this structure, what, so, what, now, what, for a long time, but not necessarily realising its significance and where, where it comes from. But this, this three-question approach forms what is known as adaptive action. So by, by looking at the objective, and again, you'll probably see some very similar, some, some big similarities to what uh, Imran was talking about with the GROW model and the OSCAR model here. And the what is talking very much about objective information. So what patterns can we see? What interactions can we see? What, what decisions help us and what decisions don't help us? And then we look a little bit at, at interpretation. So what does that actually mean? So what, how, how do we make sense of those patterns? And once we've attempted to or 
to a degree made sense of those, pa those patterns, what are we going to do with that information? What are we going to do with that, that rationalization? So there is an element of forward progress built into this adaptive action. And it's a very iterative process. So it's at the heart of it. It's got an agile approach at its heart here, this adaptive action. We, we look at something, we do some interpretation, we try and make sense of it, we do something with it, and then we see what happens as a result of it. And every day you're going to be challenged by lots of things that are wicked, that are sticky, that are tricky, that are, that are going to be challenging. And the idea here is that you can, you can try and use this iterative approach to try and make sense of what's going on and make some progress because you probably won't be able to solve it. So we're going to be looking at using the practice of standing in inquiry to deal with something that human systems dynamics calls wicked problems or wicked issues. And the definition of a, of a wicked problem or a wicked issue is, is something that's unsolvable. It's something that comes from a complex system. So you generally get um, these unsolvable wicked problems in complex systems, not necessarily complicated systems. So you've got really open boundaries. You don't really perhaps know where the boundaries are. There are a significant number of variables that are at play. And we probably can't understand how, certainly to, to the fullest extent, how they are interdependent, how they impact on one another, where the cause and effect is. These relationships are probably quite complicated and, and, and complex in their own right, in that they, they're not linear. They probably, you probably can't tell that if you change this, then this will happen. And they're impossible to solve because they can't end. They repeat, which is a good thing, but not exactly. So you'll probably see the same kind of wicked issue, but with subtle differences, subtle nuances in various different circumstances. So you won't be able to solve it forever. There are many different ways of tackling it, many of which will probably be useful, many of which may have an impact, but on their own, none of the approaches that we have at hand are sufficient in solving it. Many different people can look at the same wicked issue and have a very different perspective and be true at the same time. So we can all see the same thing differently and all be correct. There is no one objective truth to this. And there are patterns at multiple levels, multiple scales. So you can, you can look at many different things and think, is this a wicked issue? And you know, to take a topical issue. The pandemic is a wicked issue, right? It's, it's happening in a complex system. There are many interdependent variables that none of us really understand. The relationships are very complex and non-linear. We don't know that it can be stopped. It's repeating in many different ways, but not exactly the same. There are many different ways of approaching it, but none of them is sufficient on its own. We have different perspectives about the pandemic, and a lot of them can be true simultaneously. It's a, it's a wicked issue, something that we wouldn't be able to solve, but we can influence. Right? And that's what Donna walked us through in this exercise of standing in inquiry. Now, before she, talk, she walked us through this exercise, she gave us a bit of a grounding in this. Um, and, and I'll explain the exercise a little bit before you see it. But there were four things that we needed to, to bear in mind while trying to stand in inquiry. So we had one person whose wicked issue we were, we were looking to help them with. And there were many other people who were observing and participating from an inquiry perspective. And those people standing in inquiry were encouraged to try and be much more mindful and conscious about turning any judgments they may have about the situation into genuine and authentic curiosity. Being curious about the situation rather than assuming they know something. Turning any disagreement they might have into something more akin to shared exploration rather than trying to challenge or give a different approach or a different perspective, sharing any exploration, trying to turn, it, turn any defensiveness that they may feel into self-reflection and trying to turn any assumptions they may have into questions. These were the challenges that were put to us who weren't coming forward with their wicked issue. And how it worked was one person, one brave volunteer, was willing to share something that was challenging them at work. And we had a certain level of confidentiality, even though we were recording it. 
Uh, we tried to create a level of safety and, and confidentiality by offering the opportunity once we've finished the recording to, to edit out anything that we didn't want to share or wouldn't be appropriate to share in the post-production, hence the recording in advance. As it turns out, we didn't really need to do any of that, but it was there. And I think quite an important part of creating that sense of safety. That's the what. So one person shares their wicked issue. The so what part is where the observers, the, the other participants, had the chance to ask questions. And those questions, we were encouraged to make them open-ended. We were encouraged to try and strip out any disguised advice, whether it was intentional or not. We weren't trying to advise. You've probably all been asked a question that was advice in the form of a question. That's what we were trying to avoid. We also wanted to ask questions that would be beyond our knowledge. So we didn't want to ask a question where we thought we knew the answer. That was an important challenge that we had to, had to meet. And we were fully aware that the questions we asked were not going to be answered. And then after that round of questioning, the person whose wicked issue it was, was asked to consider what they wanted to do as a result, what they were inspired to take forward, what Donna called a next wise action, something that would be within their control reasonable, offered promise, and had the opportunity to get some kind of short-term response so they could see the results of that action. So I've set that up. I'm now going to um, play the video. It's nine minutes long, um, and you will see the exercise in full with our participants. That requires me to change my sharing settings to share with you a video instead, hopefully. Yeah, right. Share this one. And we are off. Um, a product or project. Jeff. The audio isn't coming through <clears throat> now, Jeff. You're 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 on mute, Jeff. Maybe you're did you, did it stop when you put yourself on mute? I don't know. Probably what it was. I was trying to try to keep my noise. Yeah, go on then, shall I? I'll, I'll have a go. I'll have a go. Okay, so um, um try, try and think how to how to phrase it really. So I guess the, the problem, the wicked problem itself is how do I gain um, engagement from uh, a development team during during the discovery phase of um, a product or a project? Often I feel like there's, there's a lack of engagement and it's quite difficult to try and raise that engagement. So that's, that's a wicked problem that I've faced. Not sure why that is, whether it's a genuine lack of engagement or whether it's not, not specifically now, but it's the problem I've faced and I, I know I'll, I will come up against in the future. So having having solutions to address that when it arises um, would be useful. Okay, Judy, would you like to read your question? Oh, so what makes you actually believe that you don't have engagement from the team? What behaviours are you seeing? Uh, so what do you mean by engagement? Yeah, the question really is, if you feel there's an issue, what is giving you that feeling of that issue? Is it like body language or lack of communication is it with the same group or different groups or yeah just to try and get an idea of the background so it's basically how did you realize or how did you measure uh, that there is lack of engagement from the team what benefits would greater engagement give the team my, my questions are what are the signs that they are not engaged 
what is the level of control over the non-engagement? And my third one is, I was gonna write it is, what is your intention behind uh, introducing that method? Uh, From me is, what are the engagement levels on the other phases? Yeah, this is from me uh, because it's a discovery phase. Do you really need the entire team uh, to be engaged in the discovery phase or having certain uh, more experienced and technical people will help? What or who do you feel might be stopping the team from being engaged? What else might be a factor in their lack of engagement, non engagement? Um, For me, if, if you can draw engagement, what does it look like? What makes you think this is going to continue? Because you can't see into the future unless this is a reoccurring theme. In which case, have you thought about trying to stop it? What would you do uh, differently than what you're doing right now uh, to, to improve the engagement? What would you uh, want to have happen for them to behave as engaged? Uh, why is engagement important at the discovery stage? Is it more important to any other stage? And so what happens if you don't get them engaged? Are you sure that greater engagement is what you want? What is, what, what is the level of engagement in other kinds of activities? Instead of engage, what about getting them married? Sorry, I just need to write that funny joke. <laughs> Somehow I knew you would make that one, Donna. <laughs> had, had it, oh my goodness. <laughs> what is your control um, over how engaged they can be? Uh, for me is uh, my question, what is your level of engagement for them getting engaged? Yeah, uh, from me really, I would like to understand how does the existing discovery process, the phase works really? Is this process a standard process within the company or is it something you have, can change at all or tweak? How do you feel when you see disengagement? And maybe last question for Judy. And does the team enjoy or hate the discovery stage? Yeah, thank, thanks. But for all those questions, everyone, um, just looking back, to see see which ones kind of stood out. Um, I guess in in months is quite interesting about how how do you well there are a few related to this, which is how do you measure or realise there's lack of engagement? So what what are the signs? Yeah, so that is an interesting one about how you detect the disengagement, and I suppose it depends on how you define disengagement. So for me. When I said that I found this in the, it, you know in the past and I might like to experience in the future, I wasn't necessarily referring to the same team. I, I'm just I was thinking more along the lines of you know future teams. I can I can imagine this problem becoming a problem in, in, in the future as well. But my kind of kind of definition of engagement or how I how I how I perceive it is it kind of being a one way street. So requirements are going into the team but there's there's, a, there's often a lack of questioning coming back and you know that there's thoughts and questions that potentially the team have got um, but they're not it, it's it, it's not coming back the other way so that that's my perception of that and that's kind of hopefully answers that question about how I me measure that it's, it's hard to put a um, definitive measure on, like a number on it, like an engagement level. Just looking looking through some of the questions as well. Um, yeah, drawing what engagement looks like that that was an interesting an interesting one as well. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what I'd, how I draw it, but I draw I'd probably draw something that represented like a bi directional communication going on and kind of a harmony within the team where there's a lot of noise a noise happening uh, as in yeah noise yeah a, a live a lively environment um lots of lots of conversation lots of collaboration
in that respect, you have to take, I hate that word, control, but it's like when you're in a meeting with loads of people and everybody starts talking to each other. If there isn't one person who's sort of steering the, the actual agenda or the meeting, it just goes haywire. Um, what about what about giving each one responsibility? I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna stop you there. So I'm just reminding us that we're, we're still in inquiry here rather than advice. It's tempting. It's tough, isn't it? Because you want to help. Yeah. <laughs> you want to help. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. It's, it's, it's in my nature to help people. I know, I know. Um, I don't know, how, how would I rephrase it then? Maybe you don't need to. <laughs> So Tom, going back to you as you reiterated the questions, like what would you like to do as a next wise action? Um, possibly, possibly put some measures around it, trying to understand the, the the root cause of that, and trying to understand whether there is a genuine disengagement or whether it's there's something cultural because often, often in teams where you've got especially now you've got you know, the teams are quite multicultural right and is that the reason it's, it's not through disengagement it's just because through, through cultural reasons people might not be comfortable um engaging and they might feel like it's an expectation that it is a one-way street and they're just being should be you know served serve requirements and serve serve the solution so maybe it's that, maybe it's not a pure disengagement. So trying to get under the covers of that is, is something to work on, I think. Okay, we'll bring you back to this one. So I think Tom's here. Well, anything you want yep. to add hey, to that, Tom? Um, I suppose the thing to add, add for me is about the experience. It's a, it's an, it's an interesting experience. Uh, I've never done that kind of activity before, and for me, it's quite a quite an uncomfortable experience with people that are offering you um, sometimes advice or what feels like advice, even though it's not really advice. It's questioning, but you want to respond, and to not be allowed to respond to people that are <laughs> trying to try to help you out feels a bit antisocial and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of some some feedback from the experience. But as you do it as you do it more often, I think that's something that you would you know be become be able to become comfortable with. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, fantastic. It's a fantastic technique and something that really does provoke a lot of a lot of thoughts and, and, and action as well. So it's a great thing to be part of. How did not being able to provide an answer to the questions help you, do you think? Um, I think the biggest, the, probably the biggest benefit was that you could, you, because you're inside the problem and other people, it's not other people's problem you can um, kind of fabricate your own, because you can fabricate your own solutions, it's not being influenced too heavily on other people's experiences. It's, it's solely your experience because only you truly know how you feel and what the environment's lo actually like that you're kind of talking about. Mm. Yeah. So it's Being truly, truly personal. Asking you questions, it was it was it was quite odd to begin with, not seeing an answer come back because that's what we're used to. But in the end, I think it, it freed me up to ask something that I probably wouldn't have asked if I knew I was going to get an answer, if you know what I mean. Um, and what what I noticed when you were giving your debrief was Donna asked you which questions landed, but actually you didn't pull pull out. A particular question you pulled out a couple and merged them together if you like which which led to your action around metrics and engagement and culture um yeah it was quite it was quite hard to because because you were being peppered with so many questions 
it was hard. It was quite difficult to without because I wasn't writing them down. <clears throat> it was hard to. It, there, were, there were some that kind of stood out as being key things that I could I could use to kind of formulate a a, a response. Mm. So that 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 was difficult because they were coming, they were coming so fast. For everybody else's benefit, they were they were coming in the chat as well. So we were typing them as well as asking them. So Tom had a record of all of them as they were coming out at the end. Um, but I know from just from my my personal experience, it's difficult to when I'm coaching, and even if I'm adopting one of those models that Imran talked you through this morning, it's very difficult to to get off a train of thought as a coach. And so if I ask a question and you give me an answer, I'll naturally follow up down that line of thought whereas actually we were giving you lots and lots of questions and it was a case of well what's stuck for you not what's stuck for us but what's stuck for you uh, and it turned out that it was a sort of combination of things which was quite interesting um, i'm going to ask david or anybody actually if they can help with a little bit of logistical arrangements and putting people into breakout rooms for a minute. And uh, basically what, what I would like people to do is, is talk with some other people about what they noticed in the video during the exercise. What did you learn? So what's your so what? Uh, um, is there anything in particular that you would like to do as a next wise action uh, based on what you've, what you've seen and what you've interpreted? And if anybody particularly wants to share what went on or what they talked about, absolutely, I'm more, more than happy to do that, but I'm not going to put anybody on the spot. We were joking that we'd invite Tom to another torture session. I mean, a, another inquiry session. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a experienced uh, inquiry. The victim, now. I mean. Uh... <laughs> there was a bit of... Jeff video, the Jeff, the video that Jeff shared didn't... Um didn't really con convey the the awkwardness of people not wanting to share but it was it, yeah it was it was good to do it yeah i mean one of the big things i think that came up as well was how, how was it was that real time how much time did you have to digest the questions uh the the the, the frequency of the questions was pretty real i mean I, I did see jeff you did take some gaps out but it was pretty much pretty much real time they were just being literally machine gunned at me we should we yeah so we, we, we were discussing we quite like the idea of doing a doing something like that having the questions machine gunned at you and then having like three years to go and think about it <laughs> which if it's a bit complicated problem it's probably quite useful to, to get that distance and the time um, rather than trying to have to come up with an answer straight away <laughs> to be honest i did i did wonder kind of related that about how long you've got to think about it was I mentioned this in, in the breakout room just now is what would happen if you get to the to the so what and nothing's nothing's really resonated you're not you haven't really been inspired by the questions mm. um what happens if you say no idea I, I don't know what I'd do yeah what would you do go back around the loop find some new inquirers <laughs> yeah I mean to be honest I haven't I haven't seen that happen um and so there's an argument for is it worth preparing for something that's highly unlikely to happen or just just trust the process um but my instinct would be that that would be telling me something i'm not sure what it would be telling me but it would be telling me something um probably to do with my scope of control or my my, my outlook of, of optimism or, or, or helplessness or something like that um, but if i didn't feel that there was something that i could do something small that i could try that would be promising uh, after all of that potential help and um, yeah that would that was that would make me really think about my my place in this there are some questions in the chat um so john says it, it felt very full-on would you do this in a session like that with eight people or would it be more one-to-one -one? and then um, in fact, while, while you were in your breakout rooms, David and I were talking about this, and it was actually a, a question that came up in the session as well that we had a bit of a discussion about. You know, what's the optimum number? What are the what are the limits and things like that? And Donna was saying how she's she's seen this work in very large groups, um, and even smaller than the groups that we've had, 
my my default that I tend to work towards is around about six or seven. Um, but that's my personal biases that are coming through in that, probably filtered from years of, of Scrum where the optimum team size is seven and seven is the magic number and all these different things that are affecting my view. But the, the two things that I'm trying to get a balance of when I'm looking at numbers for me is I want diversity. Uh, I want a number of different perspectives uh, for the richness of, of the inquiry. But equally, I don't want so many people that anybody doesn't feel safe. And generally speaking, the higher the numbers, the less safety there is in general. Um, and then from the one to one perspective, you know, I was saying how this is something that you can take off the shelf and you can run as, as a group session and, and benefit from the from the diversity of perspectives. But equally, this this is an opportunity for each one of us, not just Tom to get some benefit, but each one of us to practice standing in inquiry because it's very difficult sometimes to not get carried away with trying to find a solution it's very difficult to to avoid judging or having our own preconceptions about what's going on filtering it through our own experiences and practice getting into that state of genuine authentic curiosity that it's it's a, it's an opportunity to to practice and, and work and develop and strengthen one of those specific coaching muscles, if you like, that you could then bring into your one-to-one -one coaching practice or your one-to-one -one agile coaching, or even just your own self-reflection, getting more inquiry-like with your own personal reflections. Um, did that answer the question, John? I think so, yes, thank you. Cool. Uh, Ian asks, have I seen something like this go badly wrong? It could feel like being on the end of a bit of a kicking. I think that's really why um, you know, Donna made a really good point about defining what inquiry is. Um, and that idea of it's not about asking leading questions. It's not about passing judgment. It's not about giving opinions. It's not about giving advice. It's not about um, making that person feel like they've missed something. It's, it's genuine, curious. Uh, genuine authentic curiosity um, and that that's why I don't think I've seen it go wrong but uh, I mean I would say even with that intent even with the way that it was framed and set up with people knowing what they were getting involved in and all that preamble from, from Donna that, that put it once you're in there it's very very difficult to stay in inquiry um, and so it could, unless you've got some facilitation, some someone neutral perhaps, who can just keep an eye out for, are we, are we, are we, are we sort of getting out of inquiry again? Um, it could easily fall into that category. Well, not easily, but I think it could. Anything else in there? Is this, or oh, I have to admit, I'm not, I think wait into this with two, maybe Diana last and circles and soup. I have to admit, I don't, I'm not familiar enough to be able to compare and contrast Diana's exercise. Um, but there's a secondary question from Tristan there and how would you introduce it? Um, so I've, I've introduced it in a couple of different contexts with teams and even differently um, in, in more sort of one-to-one -one practice. But generally speaking, positioning it as this seems like a really tricky problem. So often, for example, at a milestone retrospective, as opposed to a heartbeat retrospective, looking at tackling something quite, quite tricky. And that's just getting into a habit of, of just challenging some of our assumptions, looking at what we could be, uh, what options are in front of us, what different thought processes might we have benefit from adopting uh, and inviting different perspectives from outside of the team and inside the team. Um, feels like something you might use in backlog refinement. What's the problem you're trying to solve? Yeah, yeah, I could see that. I could see that. Did anybody else come up with some interesting uses for it or any, any sort of inspiring next wise actions from their breakout group discussions? I had a question 
if, uh, if no one else has got anything to add at that point. And, and it's, does this, um, have you used this in, in like face-to-face -face as well as remote, or is it, has it all been since you've been working remotely with people? No, I mean, I, so I've been doing something similar, although not as formalized and um, sort of steeped in academic research, if you like, as this. I used to call it hot seat questioning. Um, and we, we, would, we would do this in some of my advanced training classes, but also with teams um, and coaching circles as well, uh, as, as a pretty quick way of, of providing some, some coaching supervision as well. So yeah, in person, absolutely. Sat around the table um, in the good old days. Um, yeah. Does it work any differently uh, in, in remote uh, scenarios or is it? I mean, I, I can imagine, I mean, the advantage of doing it remotely, I suppose, is just that you've got access potentially to more uh, like-minded people to, to join together. Well, not, not just like-minded people as well, diverse people. Yeah. Having a completely um, similar group of like-minded people, you, you, you end up with, with potentially groupthink and, and, and cultural. Yeah. yeah, I think that's good. The other point. advantage so, of the remote side of things is, is we had the, the chat window as well. So when we're um, doing this in, live in person, I would be sort of writing a few things down and maybe someone else would write them down. Maybe we capture them on a flip chart perhaps, but that's, that's, a, that's that what didn't feel as fluid as it felt fluid in the chat window here. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. And we had that export there and, and Tom could scroll up and down and he could see things. I felt that was a, that was a big advantage to doing it remote, personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they seem to flow. Seem to flow. Um, it's, you, you need people who are um, not necessarily like-minded, but people who are, are game to yeah. do it. Um, uh, so yeah, diversity, brilliant. But people who are like bought into it, and and um, yeah, um, I can see in this group you'd get a lot of that. Mm. Yeah, I will just cover off two in the in the chat, and then John's got his hand up. So. Ian said, I thought it would be better suited to a small mastermind group. Well, I'm, I'm going to have to interpret what you mean by mastermind there. But for me, when I see mastermind, I think of expertise. Um, and one of the challenges that we were set was to ask questions that were beyond our knowledge. So it was really to try and ask something that we didn't know the answer to. So actually having experts can lead to entrenched expertise. It can lead to, to blinkered questions and much easier to leak into advice. Um, um, sorry, could, yeah. Can I just explain what I meant really there with mastermind group? Yeah. It was kind of a collaborative group where everyone's trying to get better. Yeah. I was thinking of it in terms of triathlon and athletes sharing. Okay. Where they're not working together day to day. They're not going to worry about, you know, things being taken out of context or whatever. Mm -hmm. And somebody's saying, you know, I'm doing this training, the results are bad. And then the sort of questions, well, what do you mean by bad? And, and that sort of thing felt like it would work in that sort of group. But now, if I sat down with my team at work, I'm not sure it would have the same impact. Okay. But maybe that's a reflection on either me or my team at work. <laughs> Possible. I mean, just the fact that you, you're reflecting on that, I think is a really powerful thing. Thanks for the context. Um, Evangelo would be interested to see if what stuck was validation on the previous thought or inquiry not thought of that. Again, I think that, yeah, that is interesting. And I think that could well be something that I would, I would like to reflect on. Am I seeing new ideas? Am I seeing new insights from inquiry or am I just you know, pulling up my own previous um, biases and my own previous thoughts that, uh, that, have, that have been validated through the questions? Possible. I've got very little to gain from doing that in this group, but it, it absolutely could happen. I don't think I've ever measured that or not consciously anyway. John? Yeah, it, it was uh, a question which I think is, is similar to David's question about uh, diversity. We found that particular cultures or particular backgrounds work better with this approach or did, did, have you not, not measured it or? I haven't personally. Um, but my, my groups have been generally, I say diverse, but they are, um, I don't think I've ever run this with everybody from the same country before. 
Um, but then they probably are to sort of piggyback and, and, and bastardize John's point a little bit. They are po possibly of a very similar mindset in there, more from, a, from mm. an agile perspective, leaning, mm. um, perhaps. So not 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 as diverse as that. But no, I I mean Donna's. This is this is something that's running. She runs a weekly session like this in Asia, um, and I know they run in, in lots of different countries around the world. It seems to be something that is more akin to um, mindset than than culture. So it's, right. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Sociocracy three proposed more and pattern uses this inquiry as well. But it, it's it's um it's, it's got a lot of study and, and academia behind it, which is quite interesting and reassuring for some people. Yeah. So, oh, go, go on, sir, David. No, go on. I was going to any quick thanks, uh, David. The only question I was going to ask was if you were running this in a deliberate way so if you if you had a session where you got a group together because you knew there were problems you could you could quite easily introduce it you could spend some time introducing it everyone could be brought in you can invite the people that you knew would would participate how would how would you run this if on a more um sporadic way so if you're in a session a problem arose and you thought ah inquiry that's that'd be a great tool to address this uh, spur of the moment question how would you you couldn't do that in a you couldn't like blend you know s subliminally blend it in because you'd have to introduce it so would you ever just you know introduce it in that way more subliminally you know de deliberately as part of a session that you kind of not planned it to be in yeah I mean, there's there's a i may be taking this word i'm fairly out of context but the word subliminally as opposed to deliberately. I, I try and be deliberate in what I do as a coach, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean I planned for it. So I could still improvise and it could be more formal or informal. So for example, some of the teams that I work with, I get to a point and think, do you know what? This, this reminds me of this definition of a wicked problem. And I might just come up, this is, this is the definition of a wicked problem. Does this sound like a wicked problem? And the team say, yeah, Jesus Christ, Jeff, it's, it's a humdinger. <laughs> say so, okay cool i mean we let's maybe we can't solve it all right but that could lead to a sense of hopelessness and it's you know i've seen a lot of teams that feel hopeless when they, they, they're faced with something they know they can't solve it's too big and part of my job as a coach is to help them find some forward progress and if this is something really really important but they also know they can't solve it then i might suggest something so, and depending on the relationship we've got, they may trust me. They say, okay, yeah, Jeff, maybe you've seen something before. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Hit me, whatever's going to happen. Or um, I might just, as you say, subliminally slip it into a conversation. I might say, I don't need an answer to this, but this question just popped into my mind. What I've seen really useful is actually they've become a tool that a team can consciously pull from their toolbox. So, do you know what right now this retrospective let's go for a bit of inquiry when i, I um so i've used this this what so what now what quite a lot over the years without realizing it was a formal part of this adaptive action so i would you know, in the past quite often give a team a little video clip or a ted talk or something in a retrospective and say you know let's just watch this for 15 minutes tell me what did you notice in that video? Tell me the bullet points of that video, the narrative. So what? How is that relevant to us as a team? Now what? Is there anything we want to do with that? And having that multiple times, different people, different groups within the same retrospective or, or what have you, that same kind of thing. It doesn't have to be labelled as inquiry or human systems dynamics, or it could just be a debrief template. Awesome. Yeah. Good, good, good tips there, Jeff. It just shows that it is possible to, you know, bl blend it into a session, you know, not, you know, see fairly seamlessly, but, but kind of deliberately as well. So Rick, Rick's inspired to give it a go next week. <laughs> Let's know how you get on. Tom. Hello. How you doing? Um, I'm not too bad. 
Uh, thanks for the session. It's been it's been good. It has reminded me of this, some of the stuff we did on the ACSM. I, I think the hot seat, as you called it, I, I remember that. Um, question I had, or observation, then followed by a question, is uh, I noticed when listening to the video that some of the questions were planted around perception. So you're you're stating a problem. You're, you're saying this is a wicked problem. Uh, and one in particular was about how do you know they're not going to be engaged? You know, what? so, and what I was minded to think of was that whole thing around the difference between perception and fact. You know, mm -hmm. if we were to bring it into a courtroom and say, okay, what, what's your defense? What's your, you know, prosecution say? Where are the facts that can actually evidence these things? Um, and I've used... I've used that with teams in the past where not to sort of dismantle opinion or anything else, but just get them to think about the perceptions. So when they come along and say, oh, this just isn't working, we can say, okay, what's driving you to that conclusion? Yep. I, I just noticed that some of those open questions, whilst they were pitched differently, had a similar kind of take on them. Yeah. Yeah, and I, right. I, it's good that you brought that up because it allows me to come back to the topic that I, I one of the topics I pointed out is really important, is that there's no real universal truth with the wicked problem. You know, we all have our own different perspectives and they all potentially are true. Um, so you know, Tom had his perspective that he was seeing disengagement. Other members of the team may not see it as disengagement. And one of the, one of the next wise actions was for Tom to actually think, you know what, I'm going to see if my assumption is real. I'm going to yeah. test it. Um, yeah, that's really quite powerful, right? Yeah. Without giving a solution, you've almost led them to that themselves. Yeah. 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 Thank you.